Good morning, church. Have you ever changed your mind about anything? You know, we sometimes struggle to change our minds, but I think all of us can identify some things in life where we have changed our mind. And usually the reason that we change our mind is we realize that what we perceive to be reality, we no longer believe to be reality. What appeared to be true was not. And so that brings about change. It means that we make decisions that are different because we have new information and new data, right? It's why I think that many people in the world want to do right. And I hope and I think that most of you, because I know many of you, want to do right. But you still do some things wrong. Uh, and it's not because in many times, in many instances, I'm, we all willfully still do things wrong. But many times we do wrong just because we don't know what we're wrong about, right? Because I think most people who have a heart for God and have been, are being transformed and molded by the Spirit of God, if you have the Spirit of God in you, when you find out that you're wrong about something, you will have a willingness and a desire to change. For some of us, like me, uh, that change comes much tougher than others. We sometimes struggle to admit I was wrong because it's so ingrained in us, isn't it, that what we believe is true. Like we convince ourselves that we understand truth more than anybody else, right? Whether or not we admit that there may be somebody that knows, we, we believe what we believe is true because if we didn't believe that, we, it, you know, if I found out what wasn't true, I'd change my mind and then I would just be right about everything again, right? But sometimes, as we study through Scripture, and it is the grand, marvelous story of Scripture as we have been seeing in this series, things are not always what they seem. There is perception, and there is reality. When we kind of come, this is not the last in this series, but I would say it's the climax of this series. Because when we come to talk about and think about the death and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, it is so important for you to remember that what appears to be reality is anything but. What the world sees and perceives and, and notes in this story is not actual reality. Jesus told us, he warned us, not just once, not just twice, not just three times, but at least four different times just in Matthew's gospel alone. That after he died on a cross, then he spoke very plainly about this. Three days later, he was going to rise again. Let's scroll through them real quick. Matthew 12. Some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Show us something good. And he says, as he connects it to where we started with the series, he said, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. But you're not going to get a sign, he says. It's not going to be given, except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Uh, he already begins. Now, and you might say, well, that doesn't totally, that's not real clear, Jesus. And he's talking to people who obviously were against him. They were his adversaries, right? These were people that were out to trick him. They were out wanting to, to catch him in, in a lie. But, but let's just trans, transfer over now. In Matthew chapter 16, he's no longer talking to the Pharisees here. He's talking to his followers, those who claim to follow him, his disciples. Je, from that time on, he says, Jesus began to explain to the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And you know what, what kind of was a little bit symbolic, not, might not quite understand it over here. Now all of a sudden, and, and his disciples would have heard him talking to the Pharisees, and, you know, and they said, oh, what's this three days thing? And all of a sudden, Jesus begins getting very explicit about what's going to happen to him. Jesus does not hide it. One chapter later, Matthew 17, they came together in Galilee, and he says to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And on the third day, what's going to happen? He will be raised to life. And notice what happens to the disciples. They were filled with grief. I mean, church, uh, you know what happens a lot of times, and you've heard me use this analogy before, but if you ever go to the hospital with people and they've got a sick one, my dad told me about this a long time ago, and he, I've seen it to be true. 
they've got somebody sick and they've just went through a surgery, right? And the doctor will come out and they'll explain it. And you'll sit there over here and you're, you're emotionally involved, but not to the point that the family is, right? And you hear everything the doctor says. And then you see that person go and get on the phone with somebody else in the family and they tell them what the doctor said. And it's nothing like what the doctor actually said, right? Because they hear that first thing and then like they they heard one thing they zoned in on it the doctor keeps talking and doctor talk right 90 to nothing and all they heard was that one thing well i think this is what kind of happens as i was here he says hey they're going to kill me but they missed that on three days later he will be raised to life and it wasn't because jesus wasn't saying it he was saying it plainly and clearly it, it wasn't because there wasn't, the information wasn't present. It was because the hearers were not hearing, right? Let's go one more. Matthew 20. Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. The time is getting near, church. It's, it's getting close. And on the way, he took the 12 aside. He says, guys, come here. I need to tell you something important. All right. Remember, he's already told them twice that we have record of. He says, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man is going to be delivered over the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will be raised to life. Does that sound familiar? We just read it twice, right? He's like, all right, guys, I told you, I, I, I kind of told you, and then I told you real clearly, and then I told you real clearly again. And now, hey, huddle up, guys. Listen to me closely. But one of the most intriguing things about Scripture is that three days later, on the third day, we don't see a group of people standing around just waiting, anticipating the day that he's going to be raised from life. We, we see people who are scared, locked into an upper room by themselves, just wondering, why, where do we go from here? You see, they, had, they heard with their ears, but they had not heard it with their heart. And when they heard it with their ears and didn't hear it with their heart, it didn't change who they were or how they thought about things. So you've got these people who have been totally forewarned. And Jesus does go, right? And I, I don't want to just, we're not fast forwarding past this, but you probably know the story. If you don't know the story, we would love to sit down and talk with you about it some, some time. About the story of Jesus going to a cross and dying as an innocent man on behalf of not just me, but you for all of humanity so that we may be saved. Praise God for it. It's the good news. He goes and he is crucified on a cross just like he said would happen. He's been faithful. All the list of things that he mentions here, all, all the thing about the priest and the elders and the Gentiles, all of it is present. Every single thing has come true so far. But three days later, we don't see a group of 15 to 20 people, you know, the men and the women who are involved running to the grave together. Quite the contrary. We see some, a few women going to the grave just to make sure everything's good with the grave. But everything changes on that morning. This, Luke 23 talks about the fact that they saw this. They saw the crucified Jesus. Right? They stood at a distance. They watched everything play out in front of them. But look what happens in Matthew 27. The next day comes. This is after the res this is after after the death on the cross. They all watched it play out in front of their eyes. He says, the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Now here's what happens. This is uh, I, I gotta look ahead of myself. Let's go back. All right, so so these are the people who heard Jesus that first time, right? They heard Jesus saying about this three days later. He says, sir, we remember that while he was still alive, they said, after three days, I'm going to rise again. So we need to go put some guards at this thing. We need to make sure that they don't come and steal the body, right? And I don't think that the people, I don't think these Pharisees and the chief priests, I don't think that they really think that Jesus is going to rise from the dead. No, they think the body is going to be stolen. But they heard Jesus, didn't they? They actually remembered that three days later Jesus said he was going to rise again. Uh, his enemies remembered it. But look at the story. And, and, here's, and here, let, let's stop. All right, here we go. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about why enemies recognized it, 
But Jesus' followers, close disciples, did not. And we're going to come back to this in just a minute. Here's why. Nothing looks or feels more permanent than death. Everything in your life dies. It, the world that we live in decays and dies. Uh, the people that you live with decay and die. You are dying. Okay? Uh, I hope you're not actively dying in the sense of going to die right now, right? But you are progressing towards death right now. We're all marching towards it. It is inevitable. And because of that, there's nothing in this world that feels more permanent than death. And nothing that feels more permanent than death. And so why do you have these disciples who are over here not paying attention to the fact that Jesus said he was going to rise three days later? And you have the people who heard him say that say, well, we at least heard him say it. Why is it that they can't? I think it's because, and this is because I've, I've frequently asked myself this, why did his apostles not know, right? He told them it's right there. I think it's because we can't get past sometimes as people the, the idea that death is final. Death just feels final, doesn't it? It feels like there's no turning back. Everything changes from that point on. Nothing feels more permanent than death. But three days later, our facts change, don't they? Three days later, what we perceive to be true now no longer is true. We, we have a new lens and a new reality to go through it. Look at this. Look, Luke really points this out, I think, when he talks about the fact that when it clicks with them. He's talking about the ladies that come. There, there's the angel standing over the grave, right? And while they were wondering about this, what's happening, right? Suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Cool, cool cool right except not for them cool for us to watch they were scared to death right in their fright the women bowed down with their faces to the ground ground the men said to them why do you look for the living among the dead why are you at the grave he's not here he's risen he's come back and he says, you know, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man was going to be delivered over to the hands of sinners and be crucified on the third day he was going to rise again? Have y'all seen that before? I've seen that before, right? Just a few minutes ago, not once, not twice, not three, not four times. You know how he said that? And notice what verse 8, verse 8 is such a cool little verse. Then they remembered his words, right? Nobody's looking for Jesus to be risen from the dead because death feels so final you don't come back from that you don't you know, I mean you don't come back from from the beating and the mocking and the scourging I, I saw Jesus I stood back here and I watched what happened you don't come back from that it didn't process in their mind they were thinking about what's next but what's next in their mind did not include Jesus but finally, what happens? Angels that look like lightning scare you to death and remind you. and say, Oh, yeah, he did say that. Hey, church, that's a pretty important idea, right? It's a pretty important concept that they totally missed. And I think it's because nothing looks or feels more important, more final, no more real than when we see death. Death is the end in our mind. It feels like the end. Church, it looks like the end. When, when we bury people, it looks final. But hear me closely when I say this. You, your heart will be tempted just in your life, just like the apostles that follow Jesus most closely, to see death and think that it is final. But hear me closely. That is a lie. Okay? It's a lie. I love how Paul goes into a couple, we're going to look at how he opens up a couple of his letters. This is Colossians 1. And he's talking about Jesus, he's, and he's the head of the body of the church. He says he's the beginning, and <clears throat> notice this church, this is important. He is the firstborn from among the dead. Hear me clearly. Whatever we can know about our resurrection to come, we learn from Jesus' resurrection. You've heard me say that. I say it again because it, was the, it is the hope of our faith. It is the core doctrine of our faith. That Jesus physically rose from a grave and because of that we can too. 
He said the first, he's not just the only born. What is he, church? He's the firstborn, which implies what? There's going to be a second born and a third born. There's going to be more to come. And that's you and me, okay? He's the first one. So then everything, he might have the supremacy. This is to show that God rules. Jesus rules over everything. God was pleased. The Father was pleased that the fullness of everything that we have been leading up into the series and everything God had been leading up to in the story of the Israelites, everything would find its fullness in Jesus. Jesus fills it all full. He fulfills everything. And through him, he's going to reconcile to himself all things. Everything gets made right because Jesus rises from the dead, church. This is the gospel. This is the good news. This is the reason to be excited as a Christ follower. He says, whether well, things on earth, things in heaven, everything, anything that's off in the spiritual realm, anything that's off on earth, it all gets fixed when Jesus comes up three days later. He says, by making what? He says he makes peace through his blood shed on the cross. This event, this cosmic event, changes everything. He continues, he says, once you were alienated from God, there was a time, church, and I'm going to rephrase, I'm going to re redo Paul here, we're going to remix, all right? Remix Paul a little bit, okay? There was a time where death was final for you because you did not have God, okay? You were enemies in your minds because your evil behavior, you were, you were acting like death was final. You were living like death was final. You were living for the day. You were doing things that were not wholesome. They, they looked out for yourself. You're looking out for number one, right? Because if this is all this life we have, then look out for number one. He says, listen, you were alienated from God. You thought death was final at one time. But now, but three days later, he reconciled you. But, and notice this, by Christ's physical, it's so important that he includes that, physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. He, he bodily raised from the dead to show you that death is a lie. He says, if you continue in your faith, you establish and firm, you continue in this belief and this knowledge that you know Jesus is risen from the dead, you don't move from the, the hope that's held out in the gospel. This is the good news. You don't move away from that church. You're going to be tempted. People are going to come. They're going to throw stones at you. Life circumstances are going to throw stones at you. You're going to be tempted to start believing this is all there is and that this is final and that we've got to get it all in now because this is the end. He says, listen, you, you're going to be tempted to believe that, but listen to me clearly. God made it all right through Jesus. There's salvation available to you and he said now this is all right these are big words if you see these words you need to lightning bolts need to go off in your head he says this is the gospel this is the good news that through a resurrected Jesus, you, you have reconciliation. Through a resurrection of Jesus, you have resurrection too. He said, because of this, this is the, the gospel that you heard has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. He said, listen, and Paul does this a few times in his letters, he said, but when he perks up two times in Scripture, you really need to pay attention to what's going on. One is when the, when the movement slows down, right? We've talked about that. If, if the Bible is going at a rapid pace, it's like when I preach and I talk too fast, Ed fusses at me afterwards because I talk too fast. I'm sorry, Ed, and those that he's trying to interpret for. All right, so like, I get talking real fast, but then I'll slow down. You know why I slow down? Because I want pay you to pay attention to what's happening. Same thing with Scripture, okay? Go real fast, it slows down, you pay attention. Another thing is, is when the Bible says, hey, this is really important, listen up, all right? And the Bible doesn't do that on every page. I mean, all the Bible has meaning and it's all of value. But there's some things in the Bible that are more important than other things in the Bible. And the Bible, we know that because the Bible says, right? In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I delivered to you now what was of first importance, right? There are things that when the Bible notices and, and what he's saying when you, he says hey this is the gospel this is what everybody needs 
Remix Paul is saying, listen up, pay attention, don't miss this. He'll do it again in his, uh, well actually the only real quote from N.T. Wright on this, he says, Paul writes to the Colossians, that Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so then everything he might be preeminent. That's what we, just, what we just read. He said, we will never understand the gospel until we see it as this great narrative. The narrative which finds its way through the dark night of the soul in the long years of Israel's desolation. That's what we've been trying to emphasize in this, this series of lessons. The, the darkness that is in Israel's history and then it burst out with new life on Easter morning. On the day Jesus rises from the dead, every, all of the darkness now has a new lens to see everything through. And Paul wants you to see that. He doesn't just do it there. He does it one more time here in Ephesians 1, a passage that I love. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. This is the very thing that had not happened to the apostles at this point in the story when they're not searching for Jesus, even though he's clearly told them, I'm going to get up out of this place in three days. They, their heart, the eyes of their heart had not been enlightened. They did not see clearly the hope that was in front of them. He's, and Paul says, I pray that the eyes of your heart You've heard that song, Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I love that song, Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, only to see you. Open the eyes of our heart. So that you may know the hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. He continues, he says, and his incomparably, incomprehensible, great power for us who believe. He says that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted. The power that he exerted when he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his house right hand in the heavenly realms. He says that for far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, he says every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but the one that is to come. The, these, this concept of power and dominion, church, don't miss it. He's telling you not just about God has done something here on earth. He's telling you that in Jesus and in Jesus' resurrection, everything changes. Everything on earth, but also everything in the spiritual realm has changed. Because Satan thought at day two that he was winning. He thought that he had won. He thought that finally death, his greatest tool, had taken its most impactful event by killing the Son of God. But what appeared to be real was not real. And God placed now all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. It's the fullness of him who fills in everything. He fills everything in every way. I love that, church, because you will, you will study your whole life. You can study the Bible. You can sit down today and literally never stand up from reading scriptures. And you will never get to the bottom of that idea that he feels everything in every way that's too big isn't it everything in every way there's a lot of things and there's a lot of ways right in Jesus though everything gets filled full in everything in every way the resurrection is not just an event that happens here that gives us a model that a plan you know a pattern for us to follow well, there may be some pattern there. We might see some pattern in what happens. Hear me clear. But that's not what's, what's happening. No, there are cosmic implications to Jesus rising up on the third day. Satan realizes on the third day, uh-oh. And you want to hear Satan say, uh-oh, a lot. Things have changed forever. And so hear me closely, church. When Jonah spends 
three days in the belly of a whale. God brings him up on dry land because he's faithful. Because God's linked these stories together because in, in Jesus, this story gets filled full, church. Everything in every way gets filled. He is faithful. Look at your neighbor and say it. Say, he is faithful. Oh, man, that would... I mean, I know I hate the preachers who say, oh, we can do better than that, but you didn't sound like you believed that, okay? Try one more time. He is faithful. All right, if you don't have a neighbor, find somebody behind you. Say it one more time. He is faithful. He's faithful. He fills that story full. When Abraham and Isaac go up on this three-day journey, right? God provides the sacrifice. You know why God's going to provide the sacrifice? Because he fills that story full because he is faithful. Look at your neighbor and say, but he is faithful. All right, you got the pattern now. No excuses anymore, okay? When Joseph's in that pit again, not pit for the first time. The Bible says he's in a pit again, and he, he doesn't really see the clear view out. He gives these three-day dreams to these people that are surrounding him. Oh, and they've come true, and God gives him hope. It doesn't come full immediately. It doesn't feel full immediately, but oh, a couple of years later, down the line, we, it, we realize, oh, that was the turning point. God provided him hope in the pit. When life circumstances looked like they were going to win, there was hope in the pit because God is faithful. Look at your neighbor and say it. He is faithful. After three days of fasting... Esther is going to go before the king, the king who can say, off with her head, I need to start over. I can find me a younger woman now. And all the Jews are condemned. They're all destined to die. And she goes before him after this three days of fasting. When it looked like there were no options on the table for the Jews to survive this, by the way, the law was irrevocable. How could we find a way out of this? It looks like death is certain. There's no way you can overcome this. The facts say there are no other options. Oh, but God found an option, didn't he? In the middle of death, God delivers life to his people. You know why he delivered life to his people, church? Good job. You almost got it. Woo. All right, here we go. He's faithful to his promises. He's, and Jesus is filling, hear me church, Jesus is filling all these stories full. It's only in the resurrection these stories make sense. It's only that they really gain all of their hope. It's, it's like you have built this beautiful machine, right? And the death of Jesus is the batteries. And it wasn't no good until it had the batteries, right? It was just a pretty machine. It was just a pretty book. I, the, the Bible is a beautiful piece of literature. It is worth studying for the sake of literature. There are people who believe no words on the Bible to be inspired by God, who, who study the Bible because it is a beautiful piece of literature. But if it doesn't have Jesus, it's just a beautiful piece of literature. You have to have Jesus for it to make sense. You have to have not only a Jesus to, to live, but you have to have a Jesus to die, and you have to have a Jesus to raise from the dead three days later. Or none of this makes sense. In the midst of adultery and faithlessness, a group of people who have seemed to have totally turned their back on God, God uses Hosea, and he says, you go marry a prostitute. I want to illustrate to these people exactly what's going on. I want you to go marry a loose woman who, who's going to cheat on you and do all kinds of things to you. And then a few days later, not a few days, but later on in the story, he, God says, all right, now you need to go pursue her again, despite her faithlessness. And it's to remind us, church, that no matter what kind of hill country you go off in, hunting something better from the world, and frustrated because you can't find hope in it, and you keep hunting hope and hunting hope, and guess what? You keep coming up empty and coming up empty. God reminds us that he pursues us, that he runs to meet us, that he wants you, no matter how far away from the house you've went. Do you know why God pursues you, church? Oh, we almost got it. Uh, some of you got it. All right. Hey, good, Don got it. He was just like, he's let the echo. Yeah. <laughs> he's faithful. He's faithful to feel full all of these things. And so when it looks like death has won, three 
reason they don't see the cross event for what it is, this is just, this has to happen so we get the greatest event to ever happen. It's not what they see though. Because death looks like it has won the final victory. It looks like it's all over. And guess what happens, church? God raises Jesus from the dead. It's come and be prepared. Do you know why God raised Jesus from the dead? Yes, we got it. It was the last one. We got it. Whew, good job. He's faithful to us. Even when, even when we can't see when it will happen. Even when we can't see how it will happen. Even when... It looks like death will be the final answer. God will always provide a way. So hear, hear this, church. Nothing looks or feels more permanent than death. But you need to know who is the father of death. The father of death is the father of lies. Death happened because of Satan, his influence, and his power. The Bible says when he lies, he speaks his native language. I love that passage, by the way. That's he don't know how to do anything else but lie. For he is a liar and he is the father of lies here at church. When it looks like you're in the valley, when it looks like you're lost and there's no point, no way out, when it looks like this whole Jesus thing has been a big waste of time, Satan is working on you. And he is using his lies to tell you, yes, God may have been faithful in the past, but he's not going to be faithful to you. That's what Satan wants you to believe. He doesn't care if you believe in the Bible. Satan could care less as long as he doesn't think it matters to you. He could care less if you think all of the Bible to be true. If you, as long as you don't think it's going to be true for you. He doesn't care what lie you buy. He doesn't care what lure you bite. He just wants you to believe a lie that God, the God who has been faithful in the past, will not be faithful in the future. You know why he wants you to buy that, right? He wants you. He wants, he's, he, he in his much more limited power, but his power, he is pursuing you and God is pursuing you and you have choices to make. You have choices to run towards something that will give me a moment of temporary hope, a moment of temporary life, a moment of feeling good. But church, whether or not you run towards that or run towards God, it doesn't change the fact that three days later it's coming. Resurrection is on the horizon. It, it's, it's there, it's inevitable, it's happened in the past, it's going to happen in the future. Your resurrection is coming. And the, the question is not that. Here, look at this, Romans 6, Paul's in this moment, he's just talked about baptism, uh, Romans 5, 6, go read, it's beautiful, some of the most beautiful texts, 5 through 8, really, I think it's some of the most beautiful text in the New Testament. He says, uh, you know, he's just talked about baptism, he talked about dying, tell your old self, rising up in a new way of life, and, and killing off the old man. He says, but listen, if you've been united with him in a death like his... We will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. You see, everything that we feel about death, about it looking permanent, about it feeling permanent, about the, the crushing blow that it is because it feels so permanent, all those things that we feel about the permanency of death don't belong to death, church. Resurrection is just as certain as death. And all that permanence all that feeling that comes from death, which is Satan's biggest lie. You know, he tells Eve, no, you surely won't die. And you still die because you believe the father of all lies. He says, listen, that feeling that, here's what I'm telling you, I'm telling you that feeling that about death is really, you, the, the thing that changes three days later is we realize that death is, it's certain, but it's not permanent. And hear this. Resurrection is certain, and it is permanent. What feels like the truth now 
to this world and to a dying world, to a world that's always been dying and decaying. When Jesus makes all things both in heaven and on earth right in Jesus, when all of it comes to reconcile together, when all gets put back together in everything and every way, when we get to spend infinity exploring how God has filled it full in every way, resurrection is still going to be a reality. But death will die its final death. And in Jesus, we will have hope. That is the powerful story of the resurrection church. And that is as clearly, I think, in some ways as I can communicate the gospel to you is that that the world will try so hard to convince you of this permanency of death and this terribleness of death. But the fact that Jesus comes out of a grave three days later and he promises, I'm not just a fruit, I'm not the fruit, I'm the first fruit, and you're coming after me. These promises are yours too. You have them because of me. When he makes you that promise, church, he's saying death is certain, but it is not permanent. Resurrection, Paul says, is even more certain, and hear me, church, it is permanent. God gives us this hope. So when it looks like on the cross, when the world goes dark and Satan looks like he has won, defeat is what it looks like on paper. Hear me, church, defeat is a lie. Do you know why, church? His faith. Let's say it one more time together, all right? Because he is faithful. He's faithful. Even in the face of defeat, when defeat looks like it's won. And here's the thing that I want you to take from a lot of these stories, and we're going to keep on in this because there's more, there's more coming. Um, in all these stories, defeat looked like it had won. Like there looked like certain defeat. It looked like the end. Jonah looked like he was going to stay in the ocean, right? Do you hear me, church? Think about this for just a minute. Do you think those sailors that saw that well swallow him thought he was going to live again? Do y'all think that the people who saw Joseph dying and aging in the bottom of a pit again, in the bottom of a jail in Egypt, thought that he was going to be second in command of all of Egypt one day? You think they looked at that guy and said, yeah, man. He looked like he hadn't had a good meal in about 15 years. And he's scrum- oh, I bet that guy's going to be the, he's going to be basically the next Pharaoh. Yeah, right there. Do you think when Esther goes in that it looks like this, this woman in a world where women have no power is going to save the whole generation of the Israelites? It all looks like defeat. And it's all a lie. And it's all little stories that tell us this big story, but this is so important that you take this next step, right? I hope you've seen these connections. I hope you see how they have connected. I hope you see how these little stories represent the big story. I hope you see that, church. But you need to hear this. This is the next step in this and where we're going next. And you're not, I'm not going to leave you here, but if you're not here for this, I want you to hear this. Those little stories that make the big story, your little story is the same thing. Okay, Your little story is the same thing. You have a choice to put Jesus on to wear the, the name of Jesus as a Christian or not. You get to choose, do I get to be part of this story? Because I may be looked down pit, with pity. I may not have something that my neighbors have. I may not be able to have the house that the people in the other neighborhood have. I may not be able to get where I want in this life. And the world's going to look at you and they're going to call you lower class. If you don't have a dime to your name and you have Jesus, you're not lower class. And if you've got all the money in the world and you don't have Jesus, you are not upper class. Because what the world judges and sees is different from what God judges and sees. But when we see defeat and failure, when we see people and we say, ah, oh, these haven't done much with their life. When we see people and we judge that. We judge it on what kind of jobs they have, what kind of cars they drive, what kind of mortgage they've taken on. We, we judge it by those things. Let me just, just hear me clearly. God does not look at defeat the same way the world looks at defeat. And what you see from worldly human eyes as losing may not be losing at all. 
You know why, church? It's because God's faithful that the poor, the poor are going to inherit, the meek are going to inherit the earth, right? The people that didn't make it in this world, they're going to make it in the world to come because they put their trust into something that was faithful. So you put your trust into economies, you put your trust into governors and presidents and senators, you put your trust into the world operation of things, you put your trust in all those things, and you may have some moments where it all looks good, but those things are not faithful. They will fail. And church, hear me, they failed over and over and over again. And they will fail again if the Lord doesn't come and make it all right before they fail. Because they too need Jesus to make it all right. And until Jesus comes and makes it all right, until that grand resurrection morning, they're going to continue to try not to fail and they're going to keep on failing. So here clearly, church, you get to choose what story you wear. Because Jesus comes and he dies on a cross so that you can take on that story. So the, the story of a resurrection, the story of life in the face of defeat becomes the rallying cry of Christians that we don't mourn like others mourn. We see death and we recognize its reality, but we do not accept its permanence. Permanence belongs to the resurrected Jesus three days later. And church, that is good news and it's good news because one more time he is faithful let's pray thank you god for your faithfulness thank you for these images help us to recognize our place in this story to to wear your name out here to serve those that the world's not serving to see in them uh good when maybe no one else does help us to be your eyes lord open the eyes of of our heart so that we may see you and see your faithfulness in the past and recognize that it will be our faithfulness in the future because of your son dying on a cross and resurrecting from the dead three days later in those three days we put our hope this day and we don't put it in with doubt we put it in faith fully because you are faithful it's in jesus we pray and the church together says it Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much for being here. If you've got spiritual needs, we would love to walk with you through those things. Part of our job walking through this world is to be like Jesus. And Jesus was concerned when something wasn't right in your life, spiritually or otherwise. And it's our job. So if you had something going on in your life, don't leave here without saying, I need some help. I need something. I need, I need, I need you to spiritually walk with me through something. I need you to physically walk with me through something. I'm hungry. I need food. Don't leave here with, with needs. But if you have needs you'd like to, everybody to know about, everybody to pray about, we'd love to help with that too. We'll sing a song. And in that song, we will... Think about the faithfulness of God, right? We will think about our relationship with God and whether or not we see it publicly or privately, I just pray that you'll leave here today putting a little bit more hope into the resurrection of King Jesus. All these stories have led to this. In Him we have life. I want you to have life. If you want to let something be known publicly, come while we'll sing together. <laughs>